Amen. Amen. As I said, we're going to be reviewing our prophetic understanding of China, but first we will be going over some of the history that's already been shared. And the backbone for this study is two presentations by Elder Tess. One in October 2021, our Canadian campaign for the introduction to China. The other one for the beginning of 2022, 2014 Sunday Law and later Sia. 2014 uh, adds to that understanding. So we're going to be reviewing those. But first of all, what gives us the prophetic license to be looking at China in the first place? That's the first question. Do you know what you think about China? Do you know what you think about China? So the first thing we do is we consider our three Sunday Law histories. We've got the Millerite history, the 1888 history, and our history, the history of the 144,000. Each of these histories begins with the time of the end. And do you remember what the time of the end marks the beginning of that Elder Tess referred to in these studies? The time of the end is the beginning of what? Time of the end. What, what is happening in each of these reform lines? Is it the, um, elder is at the beginning of, of um, the end? Yep, won't argue with that. But in the context of these studies, what she was marking, so you're not wrong, Marie, but go on. Also wrong, Marie. And then the wars, my culture wars, want to the culture. The beginning of a culture war. Kutanga, kui culture war. So, um. A war Saka, between two bondo, roads that culture has to take. So in 1798, the, uh, this culture war is limited to the United States. War is and the issue is race. Or slavery. So it's limited to that particular Saka, geographical limited. area. When we come down to the 1888 time period, there have been time period, uh, improvements in communication and, and transport, etc. And, et and so transport where does this culture war take place Saka, in the 1888 time period? It, it's immigration. broader than the United States. And what's the word we use? The United States. Christian Christian Do you Christian Dom? And uh, yes, there's uh, Jews and the Irish Bongo, and the Seventh Day Jews, and free the Irish, thinkers. And the issue is religion. Thinkers. Religious liberty. Religious liberty. And then we come down to our time period and what Pat marks the time of the end for us. Time of the end. The World Wide Web, which means web. the issues are now global. The culture war is going to affect every culture, culture on the earth. War, you know, and what is the issue that under, uh, undergirds all cultures? Issue, you know, it is gender, gender inequality. inequality. And the second one is the Millerite So understanding that Saka. the... Um, the, the, this, this is a much broader war than it was in the Millerite time period in the 1888 time period that it is now a, a period global period. issue that gives us license to look at other countries. So we are going to be looking at China. Now why China in particular? China. Uh, we China. also know we have prophetic license because of the time of the end magazine and it's referenced to the time book 1989 the year that defines today's world so time magazine put out a book in 2009 10 year anniversary after 1989 to highlight what a highlight a 
pivotal year 1980 was 1991 it goes through the collapse of the Soviet Union it says the unparalleled events in what? 20 years ago triggered forces that are still shaping our world today. So that is my that book that has been referenced many times. The, 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 the very uh, many different issues that relate back to 1989. So that's another reason why we have uh, the legitimate right to be looking at China. China. Legitimate right. It's the subject of Bible prophecy. prophecy. The subject and the other prophecy. reason that brought Ime my Marka, attention to attention uh, China, why I went China. back to look at these studies, Marka, was was studies what happened in March put... of this year. And, and does anybody remember the name of the Trilateral Security Pact? That Australia uh, entered into the September of 20, security pact. What, what was it called? Uh, 2021. Orcus. Which stands for? You know, Mirachi. Australia, UK, US. Australia. Australia, UK, US. Trilateral UK, Security Pact. USA. You know, the Trilateral Security Pact. The three, uh, I'll, I'll read from, I'll read from the Guardian. So it was announced on 15th of September 2021, uh, 2021 for the Indo-Pacific region. Under the pact, the US and the UK region. will assist Australia in acquiring nuclear power submarines. And that was all that we were told in September 2021. Everything else was very vague, very quiet, and there were a lot of questions of what is this going to cost, what's involved. So it was really quite a lot of time. And then in March of this year, I'll read from the Guardian. March 14, 2023. Australia is embarked on one of its most significant, expensive and geopolitically consequential military tasks in a century. Military the push to acquire, operate and eventually build nuclear-powered submarines. The program is forecast to cost $268 billion to $368 billion between now and 2026, most of it beyond the first four-year budget period and will depend on help from the US budget the UK. So way out of our budget. And if you've seen today's news, the Army aren't really happy about that because they've just had to face a lot of cutbacks because the money's got to go into the Navy and not the Army. So that was news today. But um, it's a lot of money that we have signed up for and we cannot get out of the agreement that will take us right through to 2050. And of course there's questions over the technology, what's um what a nuclear submarine a nuclear powered submarine could do today public powered uh, to submarine detect, uh to um, evade detection it might not be able to do in 10 years or 20 years time so a lot of, still a lot of questions over it australia's prime minister anthony albanese prime minister said Weku, AUKUS plan Australia, marked a new Albanese. chapter in the relationship AUKUS between the three countries as he joined the u.s president joe biden and the UK Prime tweets. Minister Rishi Sunak and, uh, for the announcement in Joe San Diego. Biden, uh, Rishi Sunak. The AUKUS agreement we confirm here in San Diego represents AUKUS, the biggest yeah, single investment in Australia's defence capability in our history, he said. Capability it's Australia also the biggest history, transfer of Dio. wealth from Ikurusa. Australia to another country no transfer ever. Of and, um, yeah, a lot of questions complete. over whether that technology is worth it, but it certainly wasn't to our Ino former Prime Minister Paul Keating, Keating who came out uh, quite bitterly criticising it and called it the worst deal in all history, as it's been called. China responded by saying that Australia was participating in an arms Australia. race, uh, but the US calls it uh, infiltrated uh, 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 deterrence. So when you see the word deterrence, the word deterrence really means arms race. 
Moreover, I'm serious. Australia is all part of the integration of America. So this is all happening because of China, which has a large presence in the Pacific, affects a lot of our business account of the Pacific. Island nations in the Pacific as well as Pacific. So, few reasons to be looking at China. So, kapani ma reasons akati wante yatnufa na ugechitari sila China. So, we're going to go through the history. So, kati China through no rondo yacho. We won't do the full line today. As you can see, I've taken the reform line and I've squished it down to the end. Because we might get to 2001. But we'll see. And, and, um, so we have the Let's see what we can learn so far from China. Not to know the day, uh, now, keep China. in mind that the Sunday law I mean, occurs in the context law, of a culture know, war. In context of a culture war. Uh, and the other prophetic reason that we are looking at China is because of its relationship China. to Russia. Russia, Russia being the king of the South. And so when Russia we consider that Mambogusas. the king of the but South uh, in World, World War II World was World II. Germany, but Germany had alliances Germany. with Italy, Germany. we know that we can have a look at other nations that are also in alliance with Russia as we look at nations that were in alliance with Germany. So it's not just any country that we are looking at. There is prophetic significance to be looking at China. So we are going to start in 1949. The third greatest war in all history Wondo is the Chinese Civil War. So you think of World War I, World War II, the next war after that, the biggest war is the Chinese Civil War. It started in 1927 and it has two phases because, because of the Second World War, the fighting eased off in the Chinese Civil War and uh, because they had to go fight the Japanese. So the second phase of the Chinese Civil War begins in 1945 when World War II ends. And it is between a communist led forces of Mao Zedong and the Nationalist Party of Mao Zedong, which was the of Mao Zedong, which was an authoritarian government that had yeah, been the ruling China. The winner of that war was Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong. Uh, Mao Zedong. 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 And Mao Zedong, uh, oh, Mao Zedong. I should write Chinese Revolution, sorry. We can continue to go to Chinese Revolution. So Mao Zedong. So like Mao Zedong. So China becomes a one-party state. China ruled by the a one-party state. So the, 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 the state. state is the People's Republic of China and the party is the party Chinese Communist Party. Chinese Communist Party. Or the CCP. And of course the army is the uh, People's Liberation army. army. Yeah, in the People's Liberation Army. Now they were fighting Vairwa. Chiang Kai-shek, and I'll just write Chiang. Chiang Kai-shek. He was the head of the Nationalist Party. And what they did was they fled to Taiwan. So I'm going to mark Taiwan here. Taiwan. And they began the Republic of China. So we've got a problem in 1949. And the problem is there are two Chinese. So the People's Republic of China. And the Republic of China. And the People's Republic of China. Sorry. Yeah. And the Republic of China. 
And so they're going to start lobbying Saka other countries a lobby. diplomatically Ma, to be, be recognized diplomatically as the legitimate China. So, so who diplomatic. is China? Second, so dio, diplo, the, dio China, the, China, 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 has been funding Russia and supporting the funda, communists, as you would expect. Ma communists, uh, Stalin has uh, Stalin has, uh, put money into, uh, 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 backed the Communist Party in China uh, through this revolution. And so they acknowledge straight away that the, the, uh, uh, the PRC is the, why do I have written the wrong one? Do China? Say in truth, I'm going to say So, uh, but other Saka. countries are slow to come Zimwe on board. So even though Russia has been backing the Saka. Communist Saka. Party, Russia things start to sour between the two countries. In 1959, 1959. We're going to mark the Sino-Soviet split. Sino-Soviet split. Kupatana kwa kaita Sino ni Soviet. And Russia and China are going to Russia remain enemies right China. up until 1989. And there's a number of reasons there are border disputes. There are, there are, there are, there are disputes. ideological disputes over what communism is. Mao Zedong is not happy with Khrushchev. So Stalin dies in between 1949 and 1959. Khrushchev takes over and we've learnt before how Khrushchev tried to uh, 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 began the de-Stalinization of Russia. You remember the speech that he gave uh, um, the cult of personality and its consequences. Yeah, well, that the didn't cult go of personality over well with and its consequences. Neither did it go over well when Mao Zedong China backed down over the Cuban uh, missile crisis. So they're splitting ideologically. Their missile uh, crisis. Back up, partner. Ideologically, arguing over borders and things are really starting to turn sour. The other thing we want to note here is Tibet. So China has Tibet been occupying Tibet since it uh, won in 1949. So Vashaka 1949. Tibet. And in 1959, PLA, the army, were Saka in PLA, Lhasa, in Tibet, army yavo, and they invited the Dalai Lama Tibet. to come for tea. And they said, we want Lama you to come and meet with us, but you're not to bring any security guards with you. Nobody is to come with you. You just come on your own for tea. The people weren't that stupid. They, they said no, and thousands marched on the palace of the Dalai Lama where he, he lives a temple uh, to protect Dalai Lama. And this began a huge revolt. So, this big, um, what uh, China did was it squashed this revolt in a really, uh, yeah, in a very strong way. So, it, it took over Tibet. It, uh, the Dalai Lama and a lot of his followers uh, uh, left and have been living in exile ever since. So this was a, a very brutal crackdown on this revolt that was taking place in Tibet. Since then, it's estimated that 1.2 million Tibetans have been killed. And in 1960, it was the announced that the, the Chinese government were committing genocide on the Tibetans. China. So right here in 1959, the first red flags go up 
1959 kuna ma red flags ema human rights issues ano sumuka ma irani china yekutanga diyo tibi 1969 kano ita wondo between russia and china kakati pe russia ni china and um That, and that's over over border and that was a serious war it almost became sort of a board and it was able to be a peace a little bit they've been uh, they had started arguing over over the borders before then but this is now in 1969 and this is now in 1969 and this is now in 1969 and this is now in 1969 Okay so prior to 1979 the United States and the People's Republic of China America and the People's Republic of China never established formal formal diplomatic relations This is the Cold War period and the Cold War is complex. Cold War is complex. So we think of the Cold War as between the United States and Russia. But during this time we've got the Vietnam War going on. So things are getting very complicated. And the Vietnam War was the United States against Vietnam War. Communist rule. Yeah, yeah. So the American government under Nixon, they started to think, maybe we should get friendly with at least one of these communist elements. Umwe we ma communist elements ay. Vietnamese. And they started making diplomatic friendly overtures to the Chinese. And and during the period of the 70s, there was a lot of negotiations going on between China and the United States. And this culminated in Jimmy Carter in 1979. Publicly, or um, it was formal recognition of the Republic of China as the legitimate People's Republic of China. So we have formal recognition, the USA. Saka, America, in it a formal recognition to the PRC. And I'm reading from History.com. In one of the most dramatic announcements of the Cold War, President Jimmy Carter states that as of January 1, 1979, the United States will formally recognize the Communist People's Republic of China and sever relations with Taiwan. So what we have here is one China. China imwe China imwechete. So what we want to note here saka zvatinoda kuona pano and I'll just find this ndichango tsvaga chinichi Oh. I want to read to you what Jimmy Carter said. Jimmy Carter got the official part of the official. Shinja shiri official shakataura announcement. Announcement yakaita. The United States of America and the People's Republic of China have agreed to recognize each other and to establish diplomatic relations as of January 1, 1979. The government of the United States of America acknowledges the Chinese position that there is but one China and Taiwan is part of China. So that was the official announcement. And I want you to notice the vagueness of that uh, statement. So what America was saying is we acknowledge that you say, the Communist Party says, that you are, the, you are one China, that you uh, have uh, the legitimate China and that Taiwan is a part of your China. But it doesn't say that they agree with that statement. And so that's been a, a source of issue between them uh, since then. So there is 
that diplomatic uh, um, acknowledgement that acknowledgement PRC is, is the head of China, but it doesn't go. Beijing wasn't happy. They felt America didn't go far enough. And they didn't for good reason. They were very clever in the way they did it. At the same time, America is split. So when Jimmy Carter says, we recognise the Communist Party as the legitimate government, there were a lot of politicians who weren't happy with that because it's the Cold War and we're cozying up to the Communists. And so what Congress did in 1979 is it brought the Congress brought in the Taiwan Relations Act. Relations Act. So you've got the executive branch saying so executive China, branch, the, the, the communists are the legitimate rulers of China, communists and you've got Congress bringing in the Taiwan Relations Act. Congress of and this is where America Taiwan said, uh, basically, we've got your back. <laughs> uh, it committed the US to protecting Taiwan in certain ways without saying explicitly that its military would come to die America Taiwan's defense. So we kind of got a, a double take here. And, and yes, yeah, so things haven't been really good between China and, and uh, the US. It's improved, but they're still, um, yeah, they're still not happy with the way all this was done and worded. So there are two Chinas, are there one China and which one is legitimate China? So the, the US really China, support the Communist Party there. So that's 1979. The other thing that marks 1979 is the beginning of growth of the Chinese economy. So economic reforms. economic reforms. This was an, an important time for China to separate itself from the way it had been running the country under Mao and they are now going to begin uh, a different tact uh, economically uh, and the way different they economic run their economy and also yeah, the, with economy industry. industry. So there's three threads really we want to be following through this line. So the relationship between China and Russia, up a line e. relationship China and Russia, the relationship between China and the United States, which involves Taiwan, and the other one is human rights. And they're threaded. So we, we are kind of looking at them separately, but they are intertwined. So the relationship between China and Russia, the relationship between China and Russia, the relationship between America. Formally recognizing the she Chinese government, the economic Chinese reforms. But well, something else of significance was introduced into China in 1979, and that's the one-child policy. Do you have one-child policy? Oh, I'll just read about the economic reforms. In 1978, shortly after the in death of Mao, the Chinese government decided to break with its Soviet-style economic policies by gradually reforming the economy according to free market principles and opening up trade and investment with the West in the hope that this would significantly increase economic growth and raise living standards. So these economic reforms are to increase their trade relations with the West. So it wants to be a part of the big world. And the world, America is starting to realise the significance of China. It has through the 70s, and that's one of the reasons they decided to try and make things sweet with them. So from 1979 to 2018, China's annual real GDP averaged 9.5%. This has meant that on average, China has been able to double the size of its economy in real terms every eight years. So these economic reforms were put into place in 1979 and they really yeah, worked. It's the fastest growth of an economy in she known history. Yeah, economy and from 1979. Also, though, in 1979, we see the introduction of the one-child policy. 
year one child policy. It was announced in 1979, implemented in 1980, enforced in 1981, and written into the constitution in 1982. And then it was abolished in 2021. Abolished from 2021. So let's talk about the one-child policy. One child policy. As one commentator said, China's one-child policy is possibly the largest one child policy social experiment in the history of the human race. It is social experiment in the history of the human race. The 20th century included the inception of modern family planning, which restricted the fertility of hundreds of millions of couples around the world. Due to concerns about the world's unprecedented rate of population growth in the mid-20th century, some aid agencies and international organizations began to support the establishment of family planning programs. About 40 years later, in the mid-1990s, large-scale family planning programs were active in 115 countries. So in the middle of the 20th century, a lot of countries started to discuss population growth, and that was causing some concern. So family planning was uh, introduced in, across the world in many places. China's one-child policy is the China largest among the world's family planning programs. In the 1970s, after two decades of explicitly encouraging population growth, Policymakers in China began enacting a series of measures to curb it. The OCT was formally initiated in 1979 and firmly established across the country in 1980. It was the first time that family planning policy became formal law in China, differing from birth control policies in many other countries. It assigned a compulsory general one birth quota to each couple. So all the other countries, it was voluntary. China was different because it was compulsory, so it was law. According to the World Bank, the fertility rate in China dropped from 2.81 in 1979 to 1.51 in 2000. The reduced fertility rate is likely to have affected the Chinese labour market profoundly. So China's one-child policy is the biggest social engineering project in human history that places women's reproductive autonomy at its heart. You reproductive autonomy ever cards before the one child policy and other state led initiatives of birth control, abortion and contraceptive services were promoted to facilitate the entry of women into the workforce as well as to protect medical care. So, prior to 1979, there was family planning and uh, abortion and contraceptive services were available. This was the, they wanted, because they got economic reforms, they need people, they need uh, economic reforms, men and women. The one child policy, and with the advent of market economy reforms, this approach towards women into workforce fell apart. You would have thought that it would have helped women get into the workforce. It didn't. While some scholars have argued the obvious advantages of the reforms on women's education and empowerment, there are others who argue that although women acquire more and more skills to compete with men in the workforce, the gender discrimination increased in the market at the same time. As post-reform China saw a revival of patriarchal tradition, beliefs in gender essentialism, Emphasis on biological differences and relegating women's differences as inferior labourers is sore to come back. And that's from a 2019 study by Lee and James. It's quite well-known study. And what it shows is that everything went backwards for women in 1979. The economic reforms Together with the one-child policy uh, and 
And also, as we see, the increase in traditional values that the Communist Party needed to instill in order to control the populace is all led to a really bad situation for women and girls. There was abandonment of girls' adoptions. I think something like uh, 150,000 girls were adopted into the United States over, since, since that period. Uh, female, mm, excuse me, female infanticide, so they were just killed and missing girls, which means no, nobody knows what happened to uh, many, many uh, girls. They just called the missing girls, presumed dead. By placing women's reproductive ability at the heart of a major state policy to curb population growth in facilitation of economic modernization, the Chinese state compromised on its commitment to gender equality and women's emancipation. While there is a section of urban educated women who benefited from the policy as they were given the priority of being an only child and not having to compete with a sibling or especially a brother for their parents' resources, most of the women suffered physical and psychological trauma. The one-child policy led to a skewed sex ratio, which had unintended social consequences for the growing cohort of Chinese bachelors. So physical and psychological trauma. Saka, there were forced abortions. Physical women were tied down and uh, those processes were not clean or safe or painless. painless um, forced contraception. The stigma that was on women for their pregnancies, they were always watched. Uh, the men, even though the vasectomies were used, Somewhat, it was still a stigma that the vasectomy was taking away a man's manhood, so they weren't, they weren't widely used. Um, yes, it was a, a, a terrible time. It, 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 it continued, it hasn't stopped. So I want to jump ahead at this point because 1979 began the um, one-child policy and then it was abolished in 2021. So it was in 2016 that the Chinese government said you can have two children now. And then in 2021, they said, well, you can have Not three or more, let's abolish the whole like thing. Thing. So you would think that this was a, an, a terrible practice, and by the time you get to here, things are really going to be for, for women. But it's actually worse. Why would it be worse than you thought? What would make it worse for women down here now that it's been abolished? What were the far-reaching consequences? far-reaching consequences is it that there aren't many of them right now? You got, uh, I think, is it 30 million? I'm trying to find the, um, the, the correct number so I don't... 30 million more men than women. If you are in your mid-20s today, in 2023, in China, and you are not married, there is a name for you. You are called a leftover. The society and the government, the pressure on you to get married is enormous. There are not enough women. I'll just bring up a... Um, I'll just show you a picture. So here you can see in 1979 when the one-child policy comes into effect, birth rates go up and down and up, and then they're going to gradually decrease. 2016, they say, now you can have two children. Does everybody rush off and have two children? No, you've got generations. They used to having one child. And with economic constraints, they don't... There's a lot of real factors why... They just not having any more, uh, they're, they're not producing at the rate that the government wants. And so that's just gone right down. And so, um, and so um, yes, yeah, that, that, that is what's happened. 
kind of speaks for itself, I guess. Women who are still single by their mid twenties are labeled shenu, single, left mid twenties. The shift to a two-child family planning policy has shift added extra pressure, pressure on women to have family children, family but has not led to an increase in birth rate as the child shows. China's skewed, this is a, from a Vice article, China's skewed sex ratio at birth you know, China's itself a result of selective abortion of female fetuses itself. is often blamed for the bride no, no, trade. Very. But activists say the root cause is the view that women are the properties of their fathers, brothers and husbands without their own free will. While trying to preserve stable families and boost birth rates, authorities are failing to protect women from trafficking, sexual violence and other domestic abuse, <coughs> the activists argue. So what we're seeing down here is an increase in women trafficking increase in slavery there was a terrible case last year uh, 2022 last year in a stable and she'd given birth to eight children and when that made the, the news in china it horrified everybody and the, i think there were eight people that ended up in jail the husband got nine years and people weren't happy with that it wasn't long enough but this is the type of thing that's it's going on is there's this trafficking of women and we and the introduction of bride prices so now if you're a male the pressure is also on you because you're going to have to have an apartment a car money in the bank if you want a wife so um, yeah, the, the women really are property they've got to be bought so there are 30 million more men than women so how does the government plan to even out the gender ratio in china they have all kinds of plans, partly e economic, but uh, what do the men do that aren't able to marry? And that's the, the, the situation that is in uh, China at the moment, is that they, they cannot find wives, and so there's been an increase in the trafficking of of, of, of wives, uh, trafficking uh, they in are being taken from Cambodia, from, um, Vietnam, they no, no, Vietnam. Uh, take disabled women because really no, they just need disabled. to be breeders. And no, no, so the no, no, assumption no, is that families are selling so their disabled de girls, put, get price for uh, them. My families are getting some disabled uh, So a third of the women that are being trafficked are disabled. So You've got a situation where you might have a disabled, disabled. disabled. man in the village. So the village, so the village will come together, raise money to go and buy that village, you know, man a bride. And the officials will come in, the police will come in and say this isn't good because trafficking is illegal. And the people might riot, they just spend good money on a wife. So the government has a choice. Do we keep stability or do we provide or, or do we um, protect women's rights? And the priority is on the stability of the country. Priorities in stability in so even um, if it gets to court, the judge will say, I'm sorry, you've been trafficked, that's really horrible, but you know, you're married now, you're getting to apologise, and you know you've got children, so let's just keep things happy, and that's what's happening across the, the, the country. Um, so whether it's down here with the one-child policy, or down here with the leftovers, the one-child policy, then also it all yeah my leftovers gonna by the time things have not gotten better but only worse for women in china so this is a human rights issue because women's rights are human rights and we're going to see that this is all on display for the world to see the world saw what happened to tibet the world saw what was happening with the one-child policy and that's going to continue through and the world says things but blinks really because what people see is what they see and that's what we see in china Priority is the economy. Okay, so that's going to bring us down to 1989. So, 1989. 
Saka, 1989. It's been 30 years since the okay, violent crackdown on the demonstrators in Tibet. And there's fear that they're going to want to demonstrate again. So the Chinese government is worried about it. There's been a swelling of demonstrations in Tibet leading up to 1989. And so what the Chinese government does is it sends the PLA over to the border. And they uh, again, there's a massive crackdown and they institute martial law. And hundreds die in Tibet. We marked Tibet here in 1989. Sati no maka shakari Tibet pana 1989. And I'll just read. Oh, where's that gone? Here it is. This is from the New York Times. New York Times. In March of 1989. March 1989. Experts on Tibet say the anti-Chinese unrest Tibet there represents the, the most serious challenge to Beijing's rule since the violent uprising that began 30 years ago this week. The three days of clashes this week are the latest in a series of demonstrations over the last 18 months by Tibetans calling for independence or protesting what they maintain are discriminatory Chinese policies. Okay, it goes on to say some China specialists say Beijing's decision to impose martial law in Lhasa, itself a highly unusual step, was in part motivated by a series of recent threats to the communists' control. These include inflation, widespread official corruption and signs of local independence, like the sudden migration of hundreds of thousands of workers to the southern city of Canton in search of jobs. The party's great fear is that the perception that it is losing control will lead to student protests and then worker protests, and then the whole country will be out of control, said Merle Goldman, a professor of history at Boston University. Things aren't too good for China at the beginning of 1989. And they are worried that if they do not stamp down on Tibet, that things are going to get out of control with student protests and worker protests. The problem, so they, they, they bring in this uh, martial law in Tibet and it's, it's brutal. And the people in China, they're not paying any attention because that's that stuff over on the border. That's what they, the country, that's what the army does with other people. They would never do that to us. So there's a swelling of uh, discontent within China itself. We often think of that as student protests and we mark the death of Hugh Yabang. Yu Yabang, who was a leading reformer in the government, who wanted to see more transparency in the government and uh, yeah, economic reforms, my economic reforms, and and uh, uh, more media freedom of the press. Freedom, yeah, and he person. died. He dies in April. Yeah, and he, he doesn't get the recognition April. of the government that the people ah, would like. They feel they like they the, that their hopes could die yeah, with yeah, the death yeah. of this man. And I so you see students so coming so out onto, uh, uh, demonstrating uh, right across Beijing. And there are demonstrations actually right across Beijing. the country. And it's not just student-led. There are okay, so yes, elite yes, intellectuals that are students. wanting uh, Pana, increasing wages, there are workers that are not happy, but there is also one study uh, that shows that in the country of Tibet, uh, the students and what they're saying 
is that uh, there, there's many reasons why there's this swelling of discontent, but there's an, also a visceral effect because of the one-child policy. People are very unhappy with that, and that's also at the basis of these uh, protests. So, June 4, Saga, June 4. Uh, Hugh Hyobang dies. Hugh Hyobang Anufa. His body is finally taken to the Monument of the Heroes in Tiananmen Square. Square. And a lot of people come out uh, to protest and demonstrate. And on June 4, June 4, we see the Tiananmen. Tiananmen. Square. Square mass massacre. Tiananmen Square massacre. Kura See, kura the army are over on the Tibetan square. border. It's going to take them a while army to get back to the border. And then when they arrive Tibet, back, they uh, spread down that, those demonstrations. Uh, June 5, June 5, the Tiananmen Square massacre. The protests started on April 15 and were forcibly suppressed on June 4 when the government declared martial law and sent the People's Liberation Army to occupy parts of central Beijing. Estimates of the death toll vary from several hundred to several thousands with thousands wounded. Military tanks rolled into Beijing where soldiers opened fire with assault rifles on the unarmed demonstrators who tried to stop their advance. So I'll just read from a, um, a scholarly review. So a lot of this information about Tiananmen Square is not known because it's been suppressed. But over the last few years, there's been some diaries and documents leaked out from China. And scholars are able to put more of a figure and get, get more of an insight on what happened. So estimates are that it's probably around the 2000 mark that died that night. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party, the Communist Party said it was a couple of hundred. Uh, the, the big end of that was about 10,000, but it was probably about 2,000. And it all happened at night. That's why that picture of Tank Man, it's, it's, a, it's a good picture, but it's not really indicative of what happened that night, it all happened in the dark. And if you were a demonstrator, Shot. If you had a camera, you got shot. If you went down to the square to see what was going on, you got shot. If you went to your window to, to, to watch what was going on, you got shot. People got shot because they went to their window to close the blinds because they didn't like the noise. Uh, people got shot because they went to the square to sell their watermelons. So it was just a, a, a brutal crackdown. And there was a lot of personal anger and trauma related to the one-child policy that the, the government had uh, factored in. Yeah, so what these scholars are finding out is that we, we think about it as a student-led pro protest, but it was actually much broader than that. And this begins what is known as the endless purge. In June 1997, It in Ch in the in uh, the China they call it the Chinese the China. they call it the clearing and sorting out work. And what it means is everyone that marched work. in Russian the protest or went to a sit down or carried banners or who gave money to the students, anyone who participated in any way, they had to confess and report on their mistaken understanding. And there were standardized forms for this. So you, had to, you gave a form where you listed what you did and why you did and why you were wrong and, and why you agreed that what the government did was right and you signed it, you had to sign up for that. Every party member had to re-register. So what this did, did, did is it 
marked a so turning point in Chinese history where you had to lie to protect yourself or you had to be quiet to protect yourself. So there is no speaking of this a Tiananmen Square or, or any of the events surrounding it uh, among the people. And we'll talk about that when we look at um, down 2021. Because you know, people talk, but you just don't talk out in the open. So what you have down in our time period is what you call silent dissidents. So the people, they, it's almost like a social contract. Okay, we'll be quiet. You keep us economically stable, stable, provide our needs, and we'll be quiet. But they're not happy. And woe betide if the government doesn't hold up its end of the promise. So this is all quiet in the background. But the endless purge begins here, and it's still going to, till this day. It doesn't end. The purge represents the moment when you are forced to submit in public to an order that was imposed violently by an army that came and shot the people. You are not allowed to say what was wrong. You are not allowed to talk about it. You have to make this deal. Okay, so that's... 1989, the other thing is the Sino-Soviet Summit. Summit. And this is between Yeltsin and Jiang. And we see in 1989 uh, and, uh, a, a a re-establishing of the friendship between China and Russia. The four-day Sino-Soviet summit was held in Beijing from the 15th to the 18th of May 1989. This would be the first formal meeting between a Soviet communist leader and a Chinese communist leader since the Sino-Soviet split in the 50s. The meeting between Mikhail Gorbachev and then General Meeting Secretary of the Communist Gopachev, Party of China, Zhao Ziyang, was hailed as the natural Yang. restoration of party to party relations. So now we have a natural restoration between China and Russia. And this is in 1989. The summit meeting, the first between the summit two countries since 1959, is described by both sides as marking the beginning of normalization of relations. However, the domestic atmosphere in Beijing was decidedly abnormal because of continuing protests. They had to shift their meetings because of protests. So that was an embarrassment to China. So also behind the crackdown in Tiananmen Square was this embarrassment that Saka, like, who knows? I got out of Tiananmen Square. Yeah, it was only a year. The tourists were not controlled. Because of these, and and actually have the meetings, they had to be shifted around. Saka, my meetings are to find a postpone. Saka, in 1989, between Russia and China. Saka, it's very Russian. So all we've done really is we've looked at the lead up to the time of the end. We noticed the time of the end. Uh, China, uh, Russia so relationships, China. how they were sour I, up until 1989, and now they began to. Um, and now, as we'll see further on, uh, Putin. And, um, Putin. G. Uh, uh, oh, the, they say they were best friends. Where anyway, they're friends. Not best friends. Uh, it, it, it has really improved. And so we see China and uh, Russia, China and Russia, and then we see China and the United States, and how Taiwan is involved with that. And with Tiananmen Square, they actually blamed the Communist Party, blamed Taiwan as promoting Taiwan, the, the, the unrest. And we also see how human rights. Human rights uh, threaded through China history from 1949, whether it's Tibet, China, the one uh, child policy, Tibet, or the massacre in Tiananmen Square. And we'll see that continue. So that's where we'll leave it for today.
And we'll start back next time. We'll look at next 1991 time. and 96. So let's uh, close 1991 in print. A loving God in heaven. We thank you for opening our eyes to the issues that are testing the world. Lord, we, once we didn't understand these things, we were a part of it. And now we see the brutality of how people treat other people. Help us to take these things to heart, to not only see what is happening in countries, but to see what is happening in families, what's happening right around us. We know that there is lessons to be learned from the state so that we may apply them to the family. And we just thank you for external events that guide us to know where we are in history. So we thank you for this day. We pray for the remainder of the Sabbath and guide and direct us in our studies. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you, Terry. Can I ask you a quick question? Um, just on the um, one child policy, um, was that just sort of central to China in China, or did they sort of um, push that onto Tibet and Taiwan as well? It was just centralised in China. Okay, so they can't push it on Taiwan because Taiwan is autonomous, so, so that's the problem, is they don't really have control over Taiwan. Um, as far as Tibet, um, they have a lot of control over Taiwan. Um, yes, so they, they, they do have a lot of control over Taiwan. It's one of those things that was harder to implement the further you got out of, of um, yeah, so it, it was policy for all of China, but in some of the remote villages, it was hard to implement. They, um, they had, what, what would happen is the villages would enforce it themselves. So you really had to hide from your neighbours. You, you, you know, people wore big clothing. Um, uh, yeah, you, you, there was nothing really that you could um, run away from. So I, I think it, uh, it was meant to be... So when we think about what happened with Tibet, but this is what's going to lead into Tibet. how they're going to treat the Uyghurs. <laughs> it's nothing she new. What they're did did doing to the Uyghurs is what they did to the Tibetans. Uyghurs, um, but um, just, just how much they could enforce was, was difficult because of remoteness, etc. And, and the limitations of the army. Um, can I just ask? In, oh, sorry. Sorry, Rachel, did you have some more to say? I just said, I was just thinking. <laughs> oh, okay. No, because I was just thinking with what Rachel said, and the thing is, they were already sort of setting out to commit genocide in Taiwan, sorry, in Tibet anyway. So if they're trying to commit genocide in general, I guess they're just trying to get rid of them regardless. So I guess um, that would have been another factor, maybe. So I think doing my factor, Shakari. Yeah, you can't have too many of them. You have to control the population, and you can do that through fertility, you can do that through just shooting people. Uh, so uh, the, the, the student protests here, they, it's not, so you had the, the, this one-child policy really did affect people at a, a, a deep level, they were very unhappy about it. But there was also what they called, well, they would just arrest people. I think the one strike policy, something like that. It's like you had a card and if you got one strike, you were taken away, you were arrested, you could be executed. So people just disappeared. As you see in other countries, you don't hear about disappeared people in, 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 in other authoritarian countries. So there were a lot of things that um, people weren't happy about. Uh, weren't happy about. Uh, but yeah, it was um, human rights. Human rights. Um, just embedded in the, the 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 Chinese culture, and then and you've got them trying Chinese to have culture. good relations with Russia and good relations with the United Russia States, and everybody Russia wants a really good running, good running economy, and we need China. So human rights are going to get overlooked. Uh, but, oh, back to your question. What was your question?
It wasn't so much a question, it was just more a comment that it seemed to me that, you, which you kind of brought up, uh, you could control the population by putting in policies and those closer to the central government would have to be um, obviously enforcing those policies, but really with Tibet, they were just getting rid of them regardless, so it didn't matter whether you were forcing policies or shooting them in that sense or getting rid of them in any other way you could. Yeah. One in six Tibetans died. That, that, that's a big percentage. Yeah. And it's, it, you know, it's still not good there. Yeah, so in, in 1989, the Dalai Lama, I didn't say, but the Dalai Lama put forth this kind of peace agreement. He had these letters of, uh, of request to the Chinese government. And they just totally ignored it and uh, yeah, just martial law. So they've been wanting autonomy since 1950. Yeah, so they were very much into the Tibetan autonomy in 1950. Up to you presented last time, and I, um, I'll share with the group that uh, my my dad and his family come from oh, yes. China. They're Russians, but they they escaped into China over the mountains from Russia, at the end of the or around the Russian Revolution era, and they settled in the Uyghur region. Um, so that's where my dad grew up. So until he was uh, about. Uh, in 16, he grew up in the Uyghur area. Uh, mm. Then they, because there was threats of uh, sending them back into oh, Russia, um, they decided to try to leave China and they moved to Shanghai in order to try to get out of the country they were going to get sponsored, hopefully, to Australia. They got stuck in Shanghai for two years because they couldn't get out of China. China wouldn't let them leave. But it was in around 1959 when this split occurred that China was like, okay, we don't care. We don't, we don't need to send you back into Russia because we're angry at Russia. So... We won't help Russia. We'll just let you go, and they let um, so my, my, um, my grandparents and family to and actually leave and go to Australia Russia. because of that Baka split that they were able to leave China at all. Yeah, fascinating history. Tumultuous times to live along that border, to be in Russia and to be Chinese, or to be in China and to be Russian. It, uh, it, it was very difficult. I, I, Listen to other stories uh, since, since you shared that with me. And, um, you know, there, there were some brutal battles between them. And we, we, just, we, talk, we, we mark a war here, but during that time there are battles between villages and towns. And, yeah. So some of those towns have museums and memorials to them. And some of them you just don't talk about it anymore because it's just horrifying. horrifying. Hi, Anna Terry. Yeah? Um, referring to Taiwan, I think uh, Congress and the President has made their stand that they will defend Taiwan if China will... Uh, Congress, we are going to defend Taiwan. So, can China cover attack? Where they will lead, you know, these two days in, was with the statement that President Gada was made. It was a smart one. to sort of uh, leave that open. The statement, yeah, and now they really show where they stand with it. So, I think we'll, uh, we'll cause great problems for them. Yeah, I will say that. Uh, yeah, so, now you can see they're building up already. Yeah, so we, we can see that it's been a problem back here since 1949. Uh, and we'll be talking more about Taiwan as, as we head through. But I, I also remember that we've read the 10 risks for 2023 and Taiwan is a red herring. So it's not going to happen this year. Uh, and 2024 is going to have its own... Uh, issues. So, um, but we 
Taiwan is very much a part of this picture for a number of reasons. And we'll get, we'll get to that um, but, yeah, so uh, I think we can we can safely not get caught up in the hype of, of Taiwan this year. We can trust that risk uh, that it's not going to happen this year, but that doesn't mean you know, leaders make bad decisions. What did Putin do? Went into Ukraine. That's a bad decision. What did Elon Musk do? He bought Twitter. Bad decision. That's what happens when you surround yourself with people that are just going to tell you what you want to hear. And so, and now uh, G has got that. So he could make a bad decision. Uh, but I doubt it will be this year. But yes, yeah, so we'll continue looking at Taiwan as we go through. Why, why it's so strategic? I mean, we are approaching Sunday law now, right? And is the devil sort of showing his true colors through the action of the nations, getting ready or wrap up to that one? True colors are very. Ah, yeah, I think that, that's a part of it. The nations are angry. Uh, part of it. Uh, and we, we, I guess we have to have a, a an, an, an intelligent understanding of it, where it's just not, oh, ancient nations are angry, but what's the story behind all this? No, what, why? Because, because behind it all is this issue of human rights and um, you know, caring for each other or just, um, or just power and control. So what you what you see in in communist China is that it is about power and control at the expense of its people. The people of Tiananmen Square never thought that their own government would do to them what they did to the Tibetans. Uh, yeah, but they did. So the power of the state. Is, um, is something we, we will uh, explore and when we get to 2001 and we consider terrorism and what terrorism is, uh, it, it will we'll be looking into that, that more as well. We can see that there's terrorism right along, that terrorism can be used as a, um, as a handy tool when you want to create peace. <laughs> peace thank you Elder. excuse me um sorry yeah, you continue molly i didn't realize you had finished no no i'm done mm -hmm. I, I was just going to ask um, what this is revealing um could you put it in a nutshell that it's patriarchal um at play when you have the state all these these um governments trying to do what they do dictate um, that it's it's just it, it is patriarchal in play and that um as you said in your prayer about can we you know then apply it to our families then is that, um, you know can we apply that to our own lives are we trying to control other people is, is would that be correct um yeah, absolutely. This is, this is patriarchal. <laughs> yeah, so the way state rules, uh, if, it's, if it's not ruling, we, we, we're heading there, yes. So behind all this is patriarchy, is state controlling the people like you would have a husband control the wife. What, we, we, the endless purge, you be quiet, you acquiesce, you be silent, you submit, and we'll got a, got a good deal. I'll look out, I'll provide, I'll look out for you. Uh, woe betide if you open your mouth. Okay, so this is, this is, we see the same thing happen. It, so you got a small scale domestic violence and you got big small scale state violence. So people say, oh, why are we studying world events? So it's just, just, just large scale domestic violence. It's not domestic, sorry, it's, it's just large scale violence. And all violence is patriarchal. Violence, mm. yes, it is mm. patriarchal. Thank you, thank you. Maita Bas.
I find it interesting what you said about um, interesting communist China, China being a, a big experiment. Um, it seems to be... Uh, Hello? Um, communism itself seems to be a huge experiment and, uh, and it, it doesn't seem to ever have accomplished its goals, you know. It, it was an attempt to um, do away with oppression and have been as bad, if not worse, than, um, than you know, what they were trying to escape. Um, and women seem to be um, the brunt of it all the way along the line. You may end up saying the same thing about democracy. Yeah. Oh, we, we, if we can understand communism and how it goes bad and everything, we might understand how democracy can go bad. But, but yes, so, so Russia was Marxist-Leninist Marxist and Mao Zedong bought into that, Marxist-Leninist. So Marxist, Marxism is kind of the, Marxism. the economic plan how, how you're going to run your country, but Lenin is the plan down. He's, he's the um, control Lenin aspect of it. And, and so when they de-Stalinize Russia, Russia, what they're doing is they're getting rid of the Lenin aspect out of the country, not the Marxist. And Mao Zedong, he wants to keep Lenin. And so that's where they're splitting here, is, is is, you got to, China says you got to have both. China, you know, too, no, and what is. Putin is doing is he's bringing Lenin Putin back China, in. With, China, with, with, well, Lenin. Pakar. I mean, it, and, and, and you know, you got capital is, is capitalism in there as well. Because what are they doing under these economic reforms? economic reforms. I haven't got it. And so we, we talked about it last time, so but we didn't get it to this, 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 this time. But when we get to 2001, the um, WTO says, let's just let China in. If they can grow economically, they'll improve on their human rights. Because everybody will have money and they'll be happy. That's not how it works. They're just clamping down more. More money is spent to police the state than it ever was. Because you've got to keep stability. You've got to have control. So, um, yeah, come, come in here. No, as I said, Sorry, I, think, I said, I think democracy has is heading their way already. Yeah, we need to, it's like how you, you need to understand the right in order to understand the left and to be able to sift it. So to understand how communism works might help us to understand about democracy. And, um, it's, 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 what did Churchill say? It's the best. They basically said it's the best of the bad lot. It's the best option. The lesser of two evils. Yeah, yeah. He, he said it very cleverly. Democracy is the worst form of government until you compare it to the rest. As a democracy, yeah, the worst form yeah. of government. Yeah, and that's, you know, we're heading to Sunday law, which is 2024, which is the first time in history you're going to have democratic elections in the United States, in the United Kingdom, India, Indonesia, maybe Ukraine, Indonesia, European Parliament, European Parliament, Mexico. Mexico and about 55 ish others. Something big is going down in 2024. And, and now we've also got, you know, what, what, when you think about 2006, 2014, what marked the Sunday law in 2014? What was the main thing we used to say? I know there's a whole heap of things now. Like, you know, what was the main thing we used to say? Um, 
what was the thing that started us looking at 2014 differently? Nobody knew what the Sunday law was in 2014. The time. Time setting and to information. Time setting, Eddie. Yeah. Through who? 2012. Cambridge Analytica. Yeah. 2014 Cambridge Analytica, Analytica because what are they using? Cambridge Analytica, What's the technology they're using? Mind, mind. They're not. Mind. They're, they they have, can't control your mind. They don't control people's mind. That's a bit of a furphy. Internet, do you mean? What did they use? Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. Facebook. Right. So. Mind. Now it's not about Facebook. Now it's so about AI. You know, the, the, the technology is improved, and we've got all these elections and all this way to get different information to people. Um, you know, you can see the, you can see what's heading towards 2024. It's just going to be going to be a mess. When you're looking at Chi China, it's a one-state country. There is there are no elections. Um, but we can still we can still learn uh, about how they control information and how they control their people. Control information, yeah, we'll see. We are control and we'll see. So we're looking at communism and then you know we'll be looking at, at democracy too. But so, yes, yeah, um how are we going for time? How is there any any other questions? Name, any please. please. Um, per purging, yeah, you mentioned yeah, yeah, in relation to Tenement Square, but I see purging also when they uh, introduced that OCP, um, the purging of the population and the results, uh, uh, results. patriarchy sort of overpowers the, the culture and women and culture, yeah. suffer a lot more is that also kind of so the endless purge it's not about killing people although people purge, die it's about uh, controlling the narrative it's wiping and i didn't really explain that well so we'll start there next time wiping the memory of tiananmen square out of every out of history out of, it just doesn't figure in chinese history at all and we don't know much about it our, our understanding of it is limited they've purged that so when you crack down the next thing you've got to do is create amnesia Next thing, America did that when they dropped the bombs on hiroshima we don't even think about it today we don't talk about it you do something but horrific and then you create an amnesia. You, and so this is what the China did, that the endless purge. There is no, they, they doesn't figure in the Chinese consciousness, except among the silent dissidents. There are people, I mean, if you lost your only son in Tiananmen Square, you don't forget. You might be quiet, but you don't forget. And you might say, that, you know, you might have another child or whatever, and you might... It get, does get talked about in families, so there are generations of silent dissidents who might not have been alive then, but it can get talked about in families. Yeah, so the endless purge is to create this amnesia of the whole event, so it doesn't get remembered. So I, to, I didn't explain that well. Um, it's not about killing people, although people died. People were in prison, people were tortured, and a lot of people had to flee the country. Now you've explained it very well. Yeah, but I didn't in the study. So, yeah, I've come back to that, um, make that clear. I'll begin there. Yeah, like so, so it's it's not like rewriting history. Uh, it's just wipes it totally. Wipes history. Don't need to rewrite it. Just don't. It just doesn't occur. Right. It's, it's a blip. A connection. Wipe history. It doesn't occur. So you you got nothing to remember. If you, if you can't see it, it didn't happen. 
There's no footage of that night. There's no photos. Uh, there's really very little information about what happened on the tour. We got that picture of Tank Man. It tells us very little, but we, we love it. Because look at this one man standing up against those tanks. It was broad daylight. They run over him. Not really what you're looking. Broad daylight. Do it in um, the night. Elder, Elder Terry, I'm just wondering Elder with the Terry, importation of good. these cattle baby bakers from around the world, um, whether they're water. not concerned about keeping their race pure and that might Van, the mixing of the nationalities might cause a Havana problem in the future for them because they might say, oh yeah, but you're not pure Chinese, that kind of thing as well. Well, that kind of happens along the border anyway. So, you know, the um, inner relationships between the Russians and Chinese, like you would have along any border of those countries, we don't, it's, it's kind of different here in Australia because we're such an island. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think that all they need is a woman. That woman's Cambodian, it, it's patriarchal. It doesn't matter about the woman's lineage. It's about the man's lineage. The man is Chinese. Those children are going to be Chinese. Do have the mindset of the women being a pot of dirt? Yep. Just a womb. It doesn't uh, matter where they come from. So there are. So back here, umbing, back uh, here, you had mashuro. the missing ones. They, they died. They got killed. Down here, you have the missing ones. They're not. They're trafficked. They're not dead. You know, people see their child go off to school and they don't return. They cannot find them. You know, they're young brides. They've been taken and sold. Because uh, somebody needs, there's some men out there that can't, 30 million men that need a wife. And the government wants them to have it. So it has laws. You know, that this is wrong, this is wrong. But in order to create the stability of their nation, they've got to... Um, yeah, they've got to be careful how they enforce those laws. So people get away with it. Thank you very much for the enlightenment. Appreciate it. So I'll hand it back to Chris. And we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, uh, next time will be part two. Next time, we'll mm -hmm. be part two. Thank you, Terry. It was Thank great study. Yes. Thank you, Terry.